Good morning. Welcome to Austin Christian Fellowship, y'all. We're so glad you're here. You ready to worship with us?
sing it out. God, we worship because you are good, and good doesn't even describe it. You are incredible. You are amazing. You are merciful. You are forgiving. You are sovereign. Jesus, you give us eternal life. There's nothing more that we could ask for, so we sing of your goodness today.
stop working, Lord. It's what we can depend on <laughs> all the time. The word says he never leaves us. He never will forsake us. He's our comfort shepherd. So this week I was thinking about this message and I was thinking about why is it so hard for me to receive comfort from others, from God? Most of the time it's when I'm too busy <laughs> and running past it. So this song is about that. It's about making room, about stopping and carving out that time to receive it, to feel it, to give it to others. <laughs> More time with you, Lord. That's what we all need.
surrender, God. This is my surrender. Oh, here is where I lay it down. You are all I'm chasing now. I surrender. I surrender. God for this sweet morning. Uh, what a privilege it is to get to be together today, God, that we get to do this, God. Bless this message. Bless this time. Every family that's out there today or in here today, God, we just thank you. Thank you for this family that we're a part of. Bless it in Jesus' name. Amen. I would say it's hard to receive comfort if I don't know the person very well. It's hard to let people in sometimes. On the other hand, if I know the person well, it's also hard to let them in because now I think they like me for a certain reason and if I really let them see myself, are they still gonna like me? When someone comes to me with their problems, I feel like fixing it. I think receiving comfort can be hard for me because I have to admit that I have needs and that's not always easy for me to do. I think people have I a hard time. Don't always know how to get comfort. I have a hard time receiving because it can be they're hard for afraid me. in order to of what that truly person receive comfort. I have to let with others people in. At their worst. It's hard to be vulnerable with people. So, Father, um, first of all, thank you for you being here with us today. Thank you for the beautiful worship. For the just the, the way of thinking about you, reflecting on you, and worship is so meaningful to us. Um, I thank you for the chance to gather freely here in this country. I thank you for churches all over the country that are worshiping you and praising you right now. Lord, we do so against the backdrop of a pretty significant heartache, um, not just because of the last couple of years and the difficulty we face as a nation, but for what is going on in the Ukraine right now. And the heartbreak and the loss of life and the loss of property and the fear, the ongoing, Lord, for how many months that the Troops were building up on the border and stress of are they gonna invade and now they have and people are dying. And it's not effect, it's affected everybody on the planet, Lord, in some way or the other. And Lord, for us, we're gonna go way beyond complaining about gas prices and just say to you, Lord, we ask for peace on this planet. We ask you to move in Vladimir Putin's heart, Lord, and humble him, Lord, he is Scripture says his heart is in your hand and you can move it like streams of water any way you want to. And we pray you would. We pray the great revelation of the man in white might appear to him. And he might humble himself and be broken before you and repent of his ways, Lord. But I pray for comfort and peace for all those families in Russia and those families in the Ukraine whose uh, sons and daughters are not coming home. We can't imagine the heartache they feel. 
And Lord, your word tells us to, to pray in times like this. So we cry out to you, God, to move in this land, to move in that land, to heal that land, to stop this war, to stand against evil in the name of Jesus and to lift up your name and let it be proclaimed over there. I pray for the Christian church in both countries that those men and women who love you will rise up and proclaim truth and be the church and serve the hurting and be very bright lights in a very dark time. Lord, I thank you that prayer works. I'm, thank you, I'm thankful you're hearing us now and I pray you move in a powerful way. Thank you for a governor who asks us to do this, God. And we now bless you and pray you, Lord, I pray you anoint my wife and, and you give her power and authority and fearlessness and joy as she proclaims. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning. I am so glad to be here and I'm so glad to see your faces. It just makes my heart full. So today we're talking about how to give comfort. And I wanna to talk to you about that because I know you're like me and you meet people every day that need comfort. And in so many ways we feel that we're not sourced in knowing how to give comfort. I have a friend that in the past two months has endured an incredible tragedy in her family. I wonder about how to offer comfort. She's had unthinkable things happen and I bet you can think of people too in your life whether it's happened to them in the last two years or 10 years, and they're still carrying that sadness with them. Well, I wanna to talk to you today about how comforting questions can help people through hard times. And I'm pulling this right out of the Bible. If you look in Genesis at the very beginning, there were two somebodies facing hard times, <laughs> Adam and Eve. And what did God do? What did God do? When he found them in the garden, after they had done what he had asked them not to do, what did God do? He asked questions. This is what he said. He said, where are you? Why are you hiding? God modeled asking questions making space and listening as loving for healing, redemption, hope, and joy. See, if you look at the beginning with Genesis, in the beginning, God created this beautiful space for us to share. He created it, but he didn't have to share it, but he did share it with us. And then even after the fall, when Adam and Eve did what God said not to do, he made space for healing. And so I wanna to talk to you about how you can do that too. How you can make a beautiful space and the opportunity for God to heal someone simply by asking questions. It says in 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 4, I love this verse. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is our merciful Father and the source of all comfort. He comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others. I'm gonna read that again. He comforts us us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others. Have you received the comfort of God? Then you are able to comfort others. When they are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort that God has given us. When they are troubled, hurting, broken, when they feel neglected, forgotten, we will be able to give them the same comfort that God gives us. I want you to hold that. I want you to claim it. I want you to make it permanent 
And when you run into someone, a neighbor, a friend, a family member, and they are hurting, I want you to remember that you hold within your being the ability through the Holy Spirit to comfort them, to offer something to them that is otherworldly, that can do something in their life to give them their joy back. You have the capacity to do that because that's what the Bible says. So if you have received comfort, it is really good news because you can offer comfort. And it doesn't take a degree from seminary. It doesn't take being a Bible scholar. I want to break down how you do that. And I want to show you how easy it is. The first thing that you do is you ask a question. The first thing that we want to do when someone is hurting is we want to fix it for them, don't we? We want to fix it, or sometimes we want to quote a verse at them and say all things you know, work together for the good of those who love the Lord, which is like the worst thing, right? Many times that's the worst thing you can do. So refrain from that and focus on 2 Corinthians 1, 3, 3, 4 instead, and know that if you have been comforted, you can offer comfort. So the first thing we do is we just... We ask a question. We, we say exactly what God said. We, maybe it's like, where are you? Or, you know, what's going on? How are you? And then, you know what we do? After we ask the question, we make a space. It's awkward sometimes, isn't it? To make a space to let there be a silence, a pause. We make a space, and while we're making space for someone, we pray, Holy Spirit, come into this place, this space I'm making for my friend, for my neighbor. God, please heal this friend of mine the way that you have healed me when I've been hurting. We ask a question, We make a space, and then you know what we do? We listen. We don't teach, preach, chastise. One, two, three, four, and then you'll be fine. (laughs) We ask a question, we make a space, and we listen to a story. This is a practice that I've been doing for quite a while. I mean, the past two decades, I've really loved listening for stories. And it started with Acts 2, 46, where it says that they gathered together, the believers came together and they sat at the table with gladness and simplicity. And I decided that I wanted to have the church over a table at a time because ACF was getting big and I wanted to know stories. And we started asking people over. And that became a practice in my life of listening and asking questions and hearing stories. And so we took that practice, Will and I took that practice, we started doing it in other places. I'll never forget when we invited a couple that we didn't know that well to uh, one of our favorite restaurants, Fonda San Miguel. And we were sitting there and I knew the wife was a believer because she was a friend of mine indirectly. And, but I didn't know his story. And So we had gotten into the, you know, chips and salsa, and I had a glass of wine, they had a margarita. We just let it roll, right? And then I said to John, I said, what's your God story? And the wife, you know, I could see her, oh. And he said, I don't have a God story. And you know, I think that's the beginning of a God story, don't you? And all we did was ask a question, make a space, listen to a story. I think a 28-year-old Michelle who feel, you know, felt angst about God, and her relationship with God, she felt like God had forgotten her in college because she had something dramatic and tragic happen. And I remember talking with her. She had the words, and they were coming out, and I I just was like, Holy Spirit, be here. And so I asked her, can you remember 
a time when God was present and he did take care of you? And I made a space and I listened to a story and she began to unravel the times God did take care and the times she felt uncared for and she began to make connections with why she felt the way she did about God. I remember a 25 year old college guy who came to our table with my college age kids at the time and we were asking questions like we do at our table and I just was like, Holy Spirit be present. And so we were going around the table, just talking, sharing, and I said to him, tell us one thing we don't know about you and God. I asked a question, and then the space came. And he thought about it, and it could be a little awkward waiting for that question to be answered, right? But he started talking about this thing that we didn't know about him and God. And he actually said to us later, he said, you know, I've never had an adult ask me those kinds of spiritual questions. It was one of those times where the Holy Spirit came in. So I wanna propose that questions are healers. Questions are healers. And I wanna tell you that space is actually grace just letting it be open. And listening is loving. Think about kids. They want to tell you all the things, right? When they're little, they have all the words. They want to tell you all the things. And sometimes I remember if I wasn't paying attention, one of my kids would grab my face and say, Mommy, listen. Listening is loving. You know, Jesus asks us to be fishers of men, right? He said to the disciples, he said, come with me. He was talking to some fisher, fishermen. That was their job. And he was like, come with me because I want to make you fishers of men. And so I want to give you an analogy and just help you kind of like think of this when you're out with your people, when you're talking to your neighbor. What if casting a line out into the water was casting a question, just casting a question out there. You're fishing, and I don't fish, but I can imagine that when you throw the line out there, you don't know what's gonna happen, do you? You can't see what's going on. So what do you do? You sit there and you wait, right? You wait patiently, knowing that something's gonna happen and you wait. And sometimes, you know what, not that time. And you reel it up. But then you can pray for another question and cast it out and wait. And then, you know what you catch? Sometimes you catch a story. You catch a story. And that's how you become a fisher of men. Because your story, a story, his story, her story, is the most beautiful, organic piece of a person's life. Think about it. All your story, all the things that have happened to you, where you were born and how you, what you loved to do when you were seven years old and then you became a teenager and the dumb mistakes you made and <laughs> all the things combined, that's the thing about you that is so beautiful. The good things, the bad things, the way that God showed up, healed, made things new, that is the most beautiful organic piece of your life. And here is the truth. There are so many people walking around hurting right now. They need listening as loving. If the church would start listening Listening, and when I say church, I mean you and me, the individual people in the church. If we start listening more, instead of trying to fix things, if we start listening more and invite the Holy Spirit into that space, 
I think that there could be some real healing for people. And now is the time people need healing. Every place I go, people have a story. And in this last two years, it seems like it's been on hyperdrive. People have stories and things have happened and it's been hard. Just the other day, I was at our little place in LaGrange, we call it the Franklin, and I walked out to get in my car and I was ready to go, I had things to do, and a neighbor walked out that I hadn't met yet. And she walked out and we started talking and suddenly I realized, this is the time. This is the time for me to be aware of the Holy Spirit's opportunity to move through me and offer comfort. And so we stood there in the sunshine and there was cats running around. They have a couple of cats and we were talking about the cats and we were talking about the weather, how it kept changing and we were talking back and forth and suddenly it happened. I said, well, do you, you know, are you working now? And she said, no, I lost my job. Right away, make the space, right? I lost my job means something hurts. Make a space. Wait. Let her tell the story. Let her tell the story. Let me receive the most beautiful organic thing someone can give me. Their story. And she kept talking and I told her how sorry I was. I didn't offer her suggestions on where to go get a job. I didn't quote a verse at her. I didn't tell her I was a pastor's wife or running a church and John 3.16. I just made space. And then suddenly it tumbled out. I don't even remember what I asked. I just remember I had asked some questions. I made some space. And then she started telling me how she lost her son. He died unexpectedly years ago. Church happened on my driveway in LaGrange, right? Just by asking a question, making space, and listening to her story. I want to talk to you about this whole concept of listening as a form of spiritual hospitality. Spiritual hospitality, and it's something that you can do. So I want to talk about listening as a form of spiritual hospitality. Here's this great quote by Henry Nouwen. I'm going to have it on the screen. Listening is much more than allowing another to talk while waiting for a chance to respond. Listening is paying full attention to others and welcoming them into our very beings. The beauty of listening is that those who are listened to start to feel accepted, start taking their words more seriously and discovering their own true selves. Listening is a form of spiritual hospitality by which you invite strangers to become friends to get to know their inner selves more fully and even dare to be silent with you. I'm reading this book by now and where he has this quote and he uses an analogy of what spiritual hospitality looks like. And he said, it's almost like, you know, if you've come to a, a, an accident, a scene, and there's a bunch of people around, and you know, you see the policeman trying to hold people back to let the first responders get to the person who needs help. But you know how people crowd in, they crowd in and make the space smaller, and he's pushing back, pushing back. Well, he, he uses this analogy and he says, the thing is, what you're pushing back and trying to reign, keep out of the scene is your own self trying to move into center stage, trying to say the thing instead of just listening. 
it's kind of like, you know, if, if you're an actor on stage and there's two people here and someone needs focus, what you don't do is keep talking. You back off and let the person who needs focus get focus so that the artist is able to speak. Spiritual hospitality asks so much inner stability of us. It asks us to not have to prove ourselves. Did you hear that? Spiritual hospitality requires inner stability. We don't have to prove ourselves. We don't need to be center stage. And God actually can be God without our words. Isn't that great? God can be God without us saying all the things. God can do whatever he wants to do. God can show up however he wants to show up. And the real joy is being part of the process and it doesn't always require us to say all the things. Sometimes it requires that we restrain ourselves and let the other person have full focus. We let the other person take center stage and we are seated. That's what spiritual hospitality looks like. I love this quote by Douglas Steer. This is what it says. To listen another soul into a condition of disclosure and discovery may be almost the greatest service one human being ever performs for another. Isn't that amazing? Just listening. And the truth is, your story, your story is the most beautiful, organic, wild and beautiful thing about you. And maybe you're thinking, no, it's not. It's a horror. It's filled with hard things. It's not something to be celebrated. You know what I think? I think someone needs to ask you some questions. And they need to make some space. And maybe you need to be listened to. Maybe you've had hard things in the last two years that you haven't had a chance to work out with you and God. And just maybe... You need some spiritual hospitality. Wouldn't it be beautiful if we all had people who just were willing to ask questions and give space for the Holy Spirit to do what the Holy Spirit can do, offer comfort. So I'm in the middle of an online mentor program called Soul Care School, and every week I ask questions, and every week I get to hear these wild and beautiful stories from these women. And in week two, we looked at each decade of a woman's life, zero to 10 years old, 10 years old to 20, 20 to 30, so on. And all I did was ask them, and this is something that you can do, which is really easy. I asked them to draw a straight line, zero to 10, and then I said, tell me your highs and lows. What happened when you were between zero and 10? What happened in your life? Highs and lows. 10 to 20, highs and lows. 20 to 30, highs and lows. And I have to tell you that just that exercise offered them so much insight into their stories. And also, gosh, isn't it great when you can have a small group of people around and they offer insight into their story? They say, well, this happened to me when I was seven. And then this person says, well, you know what? That's a similar thing that happened to me. And then you watch the comfort of the Holy Spirit working in that. When people listen to each other's stories, you can have people to your table and ask them questions and give them space and let them tell their stories. But it's such a beautiful thing because over and over and over, these women have seen love and care and grace from God. Love and care and grace from God over and over and over And honestly, that is what has happened in your life too. But maybe you need some space to talk about your story and let the Holy Spirit do his thing. So what is your one beautiful life telling you? Let's talk about you. I mean, if I could ask you a question right now, I would say, How have you been disappointed in the last year? What's your deepest disappointment in the last year? I would make space for you and let you write it down. 
talk it out. Here's the deal. I want to talk about this. Questions can benefit you and others, and here's how they do. Telling your story helps you make sense of your life. Do you believe that? Telling your story to others helps you make sense of your life. Telling your story helps you or others detox from trauma. Trauma can actually get locked in your body. Isn't that just the weirdest thing? We think that trauma is only in our story, but it can get locked in your body. And part of releasing that is being able to tell your story and learning how to breathe through the hard parts of your story and releasing that trauma and getting healing from God. This is the other really amazing thing though. Buckle your seat belts. It's not just about detoxing from trauma. It's about experiencing the awe of God. Telling your story helps you experience awe. As I have told my story, and I've told pieces of it here at ACF before, I've told you the story of when I was in junior high and I witnessed a murder. One of my fellow students came in and shot my teacher in front of us. Did you know that when I was 14, when that happened, for the next decade, I didn't even talk about it. I didn't talk about it. I thought maybe if I locked it up, tried really hard to believe God is good and all things work together for the good who loves the Lord, I I was like, that's going to fix it. I'm just going to apply. I'm going to Band-Aid on some some scripture. I'm going to paste it over my heart, and and that's going to take care of it. That did not take care of it. (laughs) I was a fear freak. All it did was pack it in and make me sick. When I got married to Will, I remember the first time I talked about that story was probably, I don't know, five years into our marriage. I told him about my story. I said, you know, and he knew, but I didn't talk about it. And he said, you know, later he's like, you never talked about it. Like, I dated him. I got engaged. I got married. I lived with a man. I never talked about it. And all it did was make me sick. And then finally, I started talking about it and I started making sense of my life because I started detoxing from all the fear and all the trauma and all the things that happen when you experience things like that. And then I got to the awe of God. But it took me telling my story, understanding it, detoxing to get to the awe of God, okay? And you have things in your life and you are thinking now, you're like, Susie, stop talking about it. I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to revisit it. I'm not that kind of person. I'm just suggesting that perhaps If you did, you might experience God in an even bigger way. Get some of the awe of God on you. Your story is the most beautiful, wild, organic thing about you. It's not something you have to pack away and never talk about. And when you talk about your story, Sometimes other people get healing too. When I started talking to Will about my story, and I said, why did nothing bad ever happen to you? I was trying to process my story, and he said, well, actually, and he started talking about things. And he started getting healing. And he started seeing the awe of God and restored relationships. Let God do his work. Let the Holy Spirit do the work that you can't do in yourself. Open up, receive it. And then be a peacemaker for someone else and their story. Your story helps you become resilient. 
I, this is connected. I want to tell you, and I told Will this, if I had not gotten healing from what I saw when I was a child and done the hard work and answered the questions and let the Holy Spirit come in and make space and then let him make sense of my story and experience the awe of God, if I had not done that, I can promise you I would have been a freak by the time that COVID hit. Because my fear when I witnessed that thing became all about, it kind of locked itself into like germs and keep the baby healthy. (laughs) And so my fears fell into this place of if you do these things, wash your hands, da, da, da. When my child was little, that's what happened. If you do all these things, then all these good things will happen. All these rules. I made all these rules for myself to keep bad things from happening because I wasn't healed yet. If I had stayed in that place in my 20s and fast forward into my 50s and COVID hit, y'all wouldn't see me here now. I would probably be in my house with the doors closed, with a big tape around it, keep everybody out. But see, the thing is, I talked about my story. And I believed that God could heal me, and he did. And now I experience the awe of God, and it's amazing. And I want you to experience that in your life where you're hurting, and I want you to offer that kind of comfort to someone else. Ask a question, make the space, listen to a story. It's not even hard. This is the best verse, Ephesians 3, 16 and 17. I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust him. Let's let the Holy Spirit strengthen us. When we let the Holy Spirit strengthen us, and we allow him to do his work in us, what happens is we become like this little sanctuary everywhere we go. When we bump into people on the driveway in the sunshine, getting in our car, there's our neighbor. We can be a little sanctuary to the people near us by. When we're at our table and we ask a curious question, it's just being curious. When we ask a curious question, where are you? like God did. Where are you in your life? Where are you with God in your life? Where are you with God in COVID in your life? Where are you with God in your job loss in your life? Where are you God? Where are you with God in your marriage in your life? Where are you with God in your child? What's going on? When you ask that kind of question and then you make a space and you let the story come, and you are making a space that's holy, and you direct the questions, it's like you're a little safe place. You're a sanctuary for the people closest by. Everywhere you go as you practice the presence of God in your life, you're like a sanctuary to the people closest by in your life. I want to say that again, and I hope you believe it, but everywhere you go, as you practice the presence of God in your life, you are like a sanctuary to the people closest by in your life. Actually, can you change that? Everywhere I go, can you say it with me? Everywhere I go, as I practice the presence of God in my life, I am like a sanctuary to the people closest by in my life. That's like a beautiful prayer, right? Like, God, I pray that everywhere I go, as I practice the presence of who you are in my life, you'll let me be a sanctuary to the people closest by in my life. Like, isn't that beautiful? Let's make that our prayer as the church. Let's make that our prayer, that everywhere we go, we could be a sanctuary to the people who are closest by, the people that we run into, the people at work, our very own families.
Ephesians 3.20 promises this. It says, God can do anything, you know? God can do anything far more than you could ever imagine or guess or request in your wildest dreams. He does it not by pushing us around, but by working within us. His spirit deeply and gently working within us. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, you're so good. Thank you that indeed you are the comfort that we need and that not only are you the comfort that we need in the hardest times, but you're the comfort that we're able to offer others because of who you are. And I'm so grateful. Why do you let us do your work in the world? You are so wonderful to us. I pray that we would be those people. We would be a sanctuary to the people closest by. And I pray that by your Holy Spirit, Father. And that there would be power in the church because there is love in the church and grace in the church. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Can we thank Suze for teaching us? Thank you, ma'am. Uh, you guys online, um, if you'll take a moment and just raise your hand for prayer online, reach out. One of our leaders there online will pray for you. This is a great moment to let the Holy Spirit do some work. I think some of you have felt the need to get a little bolder in your sharing, and some of you need to listen more. And so you guys online, raise your hand and make sure they can, they can cover you and pray for you there. And um, next week's topic is called Good Grief. It's uh, on the verse, blessed are those who mourn. They'll be comforted. And we'll, next week, we'll see you guys next week. God bless you.